You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to the Linda Fosdick Show. Disasters are all around us. Turn on the news and Mother Nature is on a rampage. Personal disasters put our lives on hold or derail us completely. Join Linda as she invites you to become part of the solution. It's time to get off the worry-go-round with your host, Linda Fosdick. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry around, and we are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. If you would like to join in the conversation, please call in at 866-451-1451. Don't let the next disaster catch you by surprise. Get your free disaster planning roadmap and disaster checklist today at thecrisisplanner.com. Lots going on in the news this week. Oh my goodness, finally, after weeks of the CDC hemming and hawing about whether we're going to have another surge in cases or the next variant's going to come in and whether we should wear masks or shouldn't wear masks and Boy, the mixed messages were driving everybody crazy. Last Thursday, the CDC announced that it was Freedom Day if you're vaccinated. Literally, vaccinated people no longer need to mask up outside or inside, even at gatherings of people, although it is still recommended that uh, you mask up in large, close proximity crowds. But again, it's a recommendation. And the CDC is finally acknowledging that there is value in being vaccinated. And that value is that it gives you freedom from wearing a mask. Now, for those unvaccinated people, they should still continue to wear a mask in indoor situations where they can't be six foot distance. Um, Outside, I think everybody is pretty much free not to wear a mask, which I think is wonderful. Um, and it really, it is the individual responsibility for you to be smart. If you're not comfortable not wearing a mask, then wear one. And we need to be respectful of people that continue to wear masks, even you know, just because they want to feel comfortable or because they've chosen not to be vaccinated or because they may have an underlying health condition. It is their responsibility, their choice, whether to wear or not to wear a mask. But for those of us who are fully vaccinated two weeks after vaccination, it is your freedom day and you can go out without wearing a mask. And many of the large chain stores have already lifted the mask mandates. Stores like Walmart and Costco and Target and more and more stores are lifting the mask mandate that you do not have to wear a mask inside their stores. Um, again, you will see some people that will continue to mask up. That is their choice. But there will be no more mask shaming on the part of people saying, Wait, why aren't you wearing a mask? I mean, I'm so done with that. So, personal responsibility. If you are not vaccinated, it's an honor system. And you are, you know, if you choose not to be vaccinated and you choose not to wear a mask, even unvaccinated, you are putting your health at risk. But I am not putting your health at risk because I am vaccinated. So that's really, really uh, good news. Masks will, are still required in government buildings, in hospitals, medical facilities, 
um, and wherever it is posted that they are requesting that you do wear a mask. Um, and across the country, states are lifting their mask mandates. Um, New York is lifting theirs on what, tomorrow. So as of tomorrow, if you are fully vaccinated, you will not have to wear a mask unless it is posted or required. Um, the only state that is hanging on to their mask mandate, date, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that we're going to hear some uh, changes shortly, is New Jersey. Even California is lifting the mask mandate on June 15th, and they had made that decision even before the CDC announcement on Thursday. So, but New Jersey is still clinging to their masks, and um, you know, I'm sure that in the next few days we're going to be hearing from the state of New Jersey that they are going to be modifying their mask requirements as well. But certainly there have been states that have been wide open with no mask mandate throughout this entire pandemic, and they have fared no worse in the number of cases per 100,000 people, the number of hospitalizations per 100,000 people, and the number of deaths per 100,000 people. And in fact, Florida and Texas have fared better than a number of states with some of the strictest mask mandates. So um, it doesn't seem that masking really um, did anything except hide our beautiful smiles for 14 months. Um, very, very sad. Uh, so one of the things that the CDC has not yet adjusted is the mask mandate for children in schools. Uh, they are anticipating lifting that starting in September. Uh, they are still requiring children going to summer camp to wear masks, which doesn't make any sense because they are outside and they are very, very low risk of spreading the disease. But, uh, you know, as things are evolving and changing, um, there are going to be I'm sure, updates in the masking requirements for children. There are many doctors that say that elementary school children should not be masking at all because it really does inhibit their development and their social development and a number of other things, and they are such low risk of being transmitters or even of getting sick from the disease that it, it does, doesn't make sense to have them mask up. It is estimated at this point 60% of the population has had at least one shot of their vaccination. Add to that all the people that have had COVID and already have antibodies and also those with natural immunity. And that's why we're seeing like a 75% decline in the number of new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And in fact, many states are reporting zero deaths at this point. So it, that is really, really good news. Um, and no matter what your, you know, no matter what your stand is on um, the illegal immigrants coming in across the southern border, we must mandate testing for COVID-19 as well as vaccination of every illegal that comes across that border before they are released into the general population. Because we don't know what variants they are bringing in. We don't know whether they are healthy or not. And believe me, it is a disservice to all of us who have for 14 months done everything that the government has asked us to in order to get this pandemic under control. It does, us a, does a disservice for every single person who has really suffered and done what needed to be done because it was the right thing to do if they do not enforce some sort of both um, testing and vaccination on people that are just coming in from 70 different countries around the world. So literally, we, we need to protect those of us who have done all the right things and it really is the government's responsibility to do that and I'm, I'm while it's a little bit scary to me that these people are being released throughout the country without even testing them and they know that at least 10% are testing positive for COVID there's something seriously wrong with that plan because it, it violates every mandate that's in place from the federal government at this time so they really need to do something about that you know and we want to um, keep you know we need to uh, really keep everybody safe 
And that's really what I'm looking at. Keep us all safe. Do the right thing. Do what makes you feel comfortable, and you will be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. We are going to be taking our first break. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry go round. We are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio, and we will see you on the other side of the break. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current and concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry go round, and we are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And I am so excited, you know. I'm, I'm like almost ready to have a mask burning, you know, with, with these new CDC guidelines. Although not quite, because I still need to have a mask if I go to a doctor's appointment or to some of these situations that are still going to require it. So I'm not quite ready to burn it, but getting close which is very exciting so our severe weather season the spring severe weather season is in full force guys across the country you need to keep your weather alerts on make sure you have your phone alert set that you will get weather alerts there have been massive amounts of rainfall throughout the texas hill country this week eight inches of rain fell between san antonio and austin in the hill country that you know if you think about it the hill country is um it's all on limestone bedrock with very very little topsoil so eight inches of rain has no place to go except to run off and cause flash flooding so be aware during these horrible rainstorms that you need to be able to be safe, turn around, don't drown, you see running water, do not drive through it, avoid losing your life. Every year, 150 people drown in flash floods, and we do not want you to be one of those statistics. In addition, you know, where they've got too much rain in the southeast, the Southwest has no rain and has had no rain. They did not get their typical monsoonal rain this winter. And so fire season has already started in Arizona, New Mexico, and California. And uh, we do pray that they do get some precipitation uh, to help keep the fire situation under control. But just as Smokey the Bear always said, only you can prevent forest fires. 90% of these fires are man-made, man-caused. If your car breaks down, do not pull over on, over the grass. That catalytic converter is hot enough to ignite that dry grass and start 
a wildfire. Do not have open campfires. Do not burn debris in your yard. Those little flicks of, of ash can ignite fires elsewhere. Be smart. Don't throw your cigarettes out of the car window. Yeah, I know the cigarette butts smell in the car, but put them out in the ashtray and clean your ashtray more frequently if you don't like the way it smells. But don't throw them out in, into the into the dry grass because it is going to cause a fire. So, you know, while some fires are caused by lightning strikes and electrical issues, the majority of them, um, unfortunately, are caused by us, and we have control over how how many of those fires. We can reduce the number of those fires significantly. You know, obviously, there's spring storms with come with severe storm thunderstorms, giant hail. You know, they've had some three inch hail in some places. I just can't even imagine a ball three inches coming down. You know, that's the kind of ball that comes down from 40,000 feet. That's going to punch a hole in your roof. So that's going to break your windshield. That's going to dent your car. So, you know, listen for those severe thunderstorm warnings as well as tornado warnings and uh, just keep yourself safe. You know, the tornado watches and warnings have gotten much better at predicting where the storms are going to be. Pay attention, get your weather alerts on your phone, and get those warnings on your phone because it really um, will make a difference. Spring has sprung finally on Long Island. It was 82 degrees today. It was beautiful. Oh, my God, it was so gorgeous outside. I was so, so thrilled to be able to be outside, driving around a little bit, walking around outside, doing a little bit of work outside. It was very nice. And my final piece, piece from the news tonight is I am praying for peace in the Mideast between the Palestinians and Israel. They are on the verge of an all-out war at this point, and it's very scary to think that there could be that much hate, and we need to get people back to the table to talk and to find a solution that works for everybody. But... I do pray for peace in the Mideast. It's, it's, it's horrible what is happening there. It is scary for all the people that live there. And it's scary for the world because it's, a th it's always been a tinderbox. And in fact, I have a, um, a friend who happens to be a Muslim doctor who at one time I, we were having a conversation about why can there never be peace in the Mideast? And his response actually made so much sense. He said, if you think about it, the Mideast, Jerusalem, is the cradle of three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And everybody feels so close to God, nobody wants to share him. And it was like, oh my God, that's the problem. Instead of realizing that it's the same God and that we all believe in the same in inherent goodness in people that we need to start talking to each other and listening to each other and understanding each other at a higher level and trying to put some of the past grudges and hate behind us is not easy I know that but we we can never move forward in finding peace in these, this war-torn torn area of the world until we do start listening and talking to one another. So, let's see what else I have in the news. Ah, and some good news from India. I know last week we were talking about just how horrible the pandemic has been in India. And they, looks like they have turned a corner. In fact, uh, Mumbai actually had a 75% reduction in new cases this week. So it looks like they have turned a corner in India, getting the pandemic under control. I mean, it's still a long way from being solved, but it looks like they've peaked out and things are starting to come down. So my prayers also go out to India, to my friends in India, and um, I am really excited about some positivity coming out of that. 
We are going to be taking our next break and then getting to our topic for this evening, which is all about May is Stroke Awareness Month. And, you know, I want to know if you're fast. So we're going to be taking our break. Once again, I'm your host, Linda Fostek. This is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round. We are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will see you on the other side of the break. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nurse now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round, and we are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And before the break, I introduced our topic for tonight, which is the fact that May is Stroke Awareness Month, and we're going to be talking about, are you fast? So we're going to learn a little bit about stroke tonight. And I'm really excited because I, I have a very special guest on here tonight, my dear friend Kathy Casal, whose husband had a major brain bleed back in January, I believe. And yeah. um, he, you know, he made it through thanks to Kathy's fast action. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we get to that, I did want to kind of say... Okay, Kathy asked me just on this break, why is May Stroke Awareness Month? And actually, in 1989, George Herbert Walker Bush signed a proclamation 5975 declaring May as Stroke Awareness Month. Um, so it is then acknowledged as Stroke Awareness Month, and actually the American Heart Association also promotes stroke awareness because often high blood pressure is something that goes hand in hand with stroke. You know, if you get your blood pressure under control, you can reduce your risk of stroke. So stroke is nothing to laugh about, and it can certainly strike without warning at any age. And I've known people in their 20s. I've known people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, even 80s that have had strokes. Um, I knew a young man in St. Thomas who had a major brain bleed, and they literally had to airlift him from St. Thomas to Miami. Um, he could have died very easily. Uh, he was completely blinded in one eye and lost partial vision in the other eye due to this brain bleed. It was really, really serious. And he was only 27. So stroke can hit you at any age. And it is not something that you can anticipate happening. 
I have a WPN sister in Florida who in her early 50s had a major stroke. She woke up one morning and was like, uh, what's wrong with me? I, I can't, I can't like get dressed. I, I don't know what's happening. And it took her almost two years to recover. Um, one of my co business coaches in California, she had a, a major stroke in her 40s. Uh, she woke up one morning and, and, you know, she thought everything was fine, except her children said, what's wrong with you? Because what she thought she was saying was not what she was saying. And fortunately, they were able to get her help. But again, her recovery did take a long time. And, you know, both of them had long roads to recovery, but did make recovery. Um, my friend Cheryl in Florida still has some residual effects from her stroke, but for the most part, she's fully functional. Um, recently, my, my brother-in-law's brother at the age of 62 had a massive stroke. He, he was supposed to be meeting his wife at their summer place out in Orient, and he didn't show up, and she's like, she's calling, and he's not answering the phone, and they found him laying on the floor of their house in Manhasset, completely unresponsive. He's got a very long road because he can't even speak. He was unable to eat. He was, he, his whole right side was non-functional. He's now finally able to eat, and he's starting to get some of his functions back. But again, this is a young man in his prime um, he was a, a, a partner in a, in a major business firm, and a stroke took him out in a, an instant. Well, I'm really excited to introduce my friend Kathy Casal tonight, who really saved her husband's life. And Kathy is somebody that I work with. She um, does marketing for small businesses. Um, she is a proud mother and even prouder grandmother. Uh, <laughs> family means so much to her. And the day that her husband had his brain bleed, bleed, it was very fortuitous. There was a whole series of events that if they had not happened, he might not be here today. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much, Linda, for having me today. It's uh it's a story I've come to know too much about, but it's it's very necessary, I think, that people tune in to what it is all about and, and the importance of acting quickly. So I'm thrilled that I'm here with good news, and I'm here telling people that this does not have to be a death sentence or a uh, debilitating story, that it can act well, end well, as long as you recognize the symptoms and take quick action, you know, and... And I thank you. And my, my husband's doctor told me, too, that I, I saved his life. So, uh, so I remind him of that all the time. <laughs> but so it is, it is I a would difficult love story. For you, I would love for you to share exactly the events that happened and the sequence they mm -hmm. happened. And certainly how you recognized that something serious was going on and knew you had to take mm -hmm. action, whether your husband did right. or not. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> take us through what happened that, you know, that morning. Right. Well, Linda, first of all, like most people, I was so excited that 2021 was coming and maybe it would be better than 2020. And by the end of January, I was like, wow, that didn't work out as planned. Um, my husband hadn't been feeling well the last week of January. And he'd been trying to get an appointment with his doctor, which, as you know, sometimes is difficult in a quarantine pandemic. Uh, and he was supposed to have a, a telehealth with the doctor on Thursday night, but the doctor didn't sh show up for that. And Friday morning was just like a regular morning. We have our granddaughter here. She does her remote learning from here while her mother teaches. And he oversees her getting on the computer and if she has any issues. But she's, oh, yep. I guess yep. we'll continue this. Yes, we will. Uh, we are going to actually. So, your granddaughter was there doing remote learning, she, and we're going right, to continue this remote. story on the <laughs> other side of the break. Once again, I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry go round. We are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio at, with my very special guest, Kathy Casal, who's going to give us 
really some great insight on what to do when somebody is in the middle of, in her case, her husband had an aneurysm, but uh, and a brain bleed, but there is very important things that we need to do, and we are going to get back to that at the other side of the break. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit, whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round. We are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio with my very special guest, Kathy Casal, who is, we are talking about the fact that May is Stroke Awareness Month, and she's going to take us through how things evolved on the day that her husband actually had a major brain bleed and how her fast action really made a difference. So you were talking about how you were working in your office and your your right. granddaughter was upstairs with your husband doing her remote learning. Well, Take she was supposed there. to be. She was supposed to be. And I'm down here and I, I get very isolated in my office. But I could hear her running around, and it was past the time she was supposed to be on. So I, I went upstairs, and I said, why aren't you on your, your learning? And she said, well, Papa didn't tell me, which was weird, because he always oh, takes good care and makes sure she's on when she should be. So I said, go get on your computer. And as that, I said that, my husband came out of the bathroom, and he said, oh, I just threw up. And I said, oh, okay. Well, you know, that's certainly no reason for alarm. You know, people throw up because they ate something wrong. Uh, or they had a, you have a virus. There's a lot of reasons for you to throw up and not think anything of it. But for some reason, I stayed up there and I chatted with him longer before I came back down. And as I'm talking to him, he's reaching for his glasses, which are hanging on the side of the refrigerator. But he's reaching and he's, his grasp is falling short. And I said, that's weird. And I, I handed him his glasses. And then he stood up and he lifted to the side. And it was just one little thing too many for me. And there was a little voice that almost whispered in my ear and that said, now, hospital now. And I called to my wow. granddaughter. I said, get in the car. Uh, yeah. And I, I said to him, come on, let's, we need to take care of something now. And he said, I'll wait till the doctor comes in later. I said, no, no, no. I think we should go now. Let's go to the hospital. And he said, he doesn't like the hospital. He's a very stubborn man. And he said, of course oh, he I'll is. go to the urgent care. Typical man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, I'll go to urgent care. I said, oh, okay. I had no intention of going to urgent care. I knew what I was doing. Uh, so I get him in the car, and we go, and, and I'm talking to him because I thought it was good to keep him engaged and speaking. And he says, hey, you passed the term for urgent care. <laughs> and I said, we're not going to urgent care. We're going to the hospital because it was less than 10 minutes away. And he said, uh, oh, I don't think I need that. I don't want to go there. And I said, well, I've got the steering wheel, and that's where we're going. 
So we get to the hospital. I grab a wheelchair, put him in it, and go into the triage, which, of course, remember, this is the height of COVID, and the right. hospital is shut down to everybody except who needs to be in there. So I take him into triage, and that's all you have because the waiting room is now shut down and closed off. And the triage nurse is asking him questions, to which he's giving incorrect answers, and I have to correct him. And finally, the triage nurse says to him, uh, when you stand up, do you list to one side? And my husband says, no. And I said, yes. Yes. <laughs> and the triage nurse realized what I had already come to realize was that we were in the middle of a stroke. And he came around and he grabbed the wheelchair. And I said, I'll come in as soon as my daughter comes to my granddaughter. He said, no, you can't come in at all. And he tossed a business card at me and said, call this in an hour. So I, my daughter takes my granddaughter, and I sit in the parking lot because I'm not going far, right? And I call in an hour like a good girl. And the nurse says to me, Mrs. Cassell, please hang up. The surgeon is trying to call you. And I thought, ugh, we're there already with the surgeon. So I spoke with the surgeon, and he said, these are our options. He's got a brain bleed. He's got a uh, clot the size of a golf ball. Oh, my goodness. Uh, he says, we have, yes. Yeah, he says, we have two options. We can remove it immediately, go into surgery and remove it immediately, or we can take a wait and see, and the body might reabsorb. He said, the problem with that option is that if things go ugly, it will do so at the worst possible time. He says, right now we can assemble the team. We have the trauma team available. We can get the right people in the right places. And I said to him, what did my husband say? And he said, he said to talk to you. <laughs> well, that was a good thing. He had enough, yes, <laughs> yeah. he did. He had his wits about him enough to say that. And I said, all right, I agree that the surgery is the way to go. He says, okay, we're getting the team together. I will call you right before we start. So at that point, I went home because they wouldn't let me in. And what did I do? I Googled the doctor's name. Right? What are you doing these days? Right. And he got the good Google. reviews. He, got, <laughs> he came out good. Because honestly, if he hadn't, I would have shut it down and said no. I need to get a second opinion. I need to get a different doctor. But the doctor came out very good. And when I talked to him next time, when he called to say, we're ready to start, I said, by the way, I Googled you, and you came out good. So he laughed. <laughs> he thought that was funny. Um, and but the, the, doctor surgery, had, he, he, the doctor had said that this was really uh, bad. You know, he that this was not, not good. Told me that enough. No, Linda, he, he – and first of all, I should, I should let people know that I'm very good in a crisis. You have a crisis going on, I'm your person. I become a machine. I'm a fact-finding, dealing with the issues person that just goes into it. And I will, I will have my meltdown later when it's all over. But I am your best person in the crisis. So on the phone when he said to me, this is very bad. And I said, okay. And he said, no, this is really, really very bad. I said, okay, I understand. I'm sure he thought I was probably the most unfeeling wife on the planet. But I got it. I got it. I, actually, I knew it before we got there because I had that little voice on my shoulder saying, this is really, really bad. And, so and I, I need to get was. to the hospital now. <laughs> yes, exactly. So he called me then before they started. He called me when they finished. And when he finished, he said it came out much better than we had planned. We thought much better than we thought it would. He said we did a much smaller incision than we thought we'd have to, which I thought meant small. It's actually like eight inches. <laughs> so I don't know what they had thought they'd have to do. Um, and he says he's talking. He's awake. You know, he can answer all our questions. So it's much better than we had hoped it would be or thought it would be, not hoped. They certainly hoped for the best outcome. Uh, the difficult part was the next week in the hospital in uh, neurointensive care and not being up there with him because he was really not capable of answering questions. He was really out of it. But they thought he could answer questions because he knew his name and date of birth and the current date. Well, the name and date of birth, he's had over 60 years to practice. And the current date, he's never known in his lifetime, so I don't know how they're saying he knew it then. But okay. But I had then had the wonderful help of, of friends who, like yourself, and like Eileen and like Susan, uh, and Eileen has pulse, so she knew she's a patient advocate. She knew I should be asking what I should be doing and was a wonderful guidance for me and, and help. Because what I said to them very early is any time you speak to him or there's a medical discussion or a doctor comes in, I need to be on the phone. And I need that's to hear so everything that's important going on. Because, because it he, was critical. I mean, because yeah. I think you told me he has no recollection of no. anything after he got in the car no. until like a week no. later. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know? 
Exactly. And they were and having him sign for procedures that he had well, no idea what the heck was going on. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time, made worse, of course, by COVID and, and the lack of being allowed up there with him. But the, the fact, the final outcome of all of this, when he gets out and everything, he has lost some peripheral vision to the left. And sometimes he says he sees in what he calls Picasso vision, which yeah, which is everybody's distorted. But the outcome was really better than we could have possibly hoped. You know, it's it's everything you could have hoped to get away with because we really dodged a bullet on this one. Wow. You know, we are going to be taking our next break. Once again, I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round. We are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio with my very special guest tonight, Kathy Casal, who has just shared the story and her experience with her husband's like serious brain bleed and how her fast action really made a huge difference in the outcome. Um, so often when there's a brain bleed like that, people go to sleep and they never wake up. So your yeah. fast action really made such a difference. We were going to see everybody on the other side of the break. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Linda Fostek, and this is the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round, and we are live tonight on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio with my very special guest, Kathy Casal, who just shared her amazing story of just how important her fast action was in saving her husband's life when he was having a major brain bleed. It is, May is... Stroke Awareness Month, and we are discussing stroke and just what we need to look for and how important it is to act fast. So your fast action really, I mean, made a difference. I mean, it's like the little hairs on the back of your neck said, oh, something is going on here. Mm -hmm. I need, you know, and if if all these different things didn't happen, if you're if your granddaughter wasn't there, oh, if you didn't hear her walking right. around, if, you know, if, right. if you hadn't seen your husband reaching for the glasses, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have noticed some of those things. And I mean, you could have been right. working downstairs and come upstairs and found him in the chair, gone. Right. And, and Lynn, I think it's so important to to be the person who, the person in the stroke is not going to be aware of what's going on with them because they're a little dull to reality at that moment. So all they, they're knowing is it's not right, but maybe I just need a nap, you know, or it's right, not right. Maybe I just need another cup of coffee. I think it's up to the people with them to recognize that it's not right. And when you look up stroke, there's going to be a list of, you know, I don't know how many, maybe 
eight or ten symptoms that, you know, indicate a stroke and that they ask for when you go to the hospital. Do you have this? Do you have that? But Mm -hmm. somebody doesn't have to have all of them. You don't even have, you know, maybe you don't have any of them or they're not obvious. You have to listen to that internal voice that's telling you, I know this person and this is not right. They are not right. And so you you take them to the emergency room, you call 911, what's the worst that can happen? So you spend a couple of hours and they say, oh, it's just this, it's no big deal, go home. But the plus side is you can save them from a life of being incapacitated. Every doctor we go to now, because we have now six or seven doctors and we go to them on a (laughs) regular basis, you know, and every new doctor we go to that looks, reads the, the reports and then turns to my husband and says, how are you even alive? Let alone that you have use of everything and you just have a little peripheral vision left. And that's how he realized how bad it was. Because even, even after he was out of the hospital, he didn't realize the magnitude of this until they started saying that to him. I did. I lived through it. He didn't really live through it. He was out of it, right? Right, so right. Then it hit him. He said, this was really bad. I said, yes, this was really bad. This so is the person really that's bad. in it is probably not even aware of what's going on with them. So when you see somebody that's in that thing and they give you little mnemonics like FAST, right, that we talk about, right. to, to recognize that some of these symptoms are coming. But my point is don't look for all of the symptoms. If there's anything that's not right that you're saying to yourself, this isn't right, then take action right away. Because the sooner you take action, the less damage there can be. Well, they you know, call the it the golden late. hour. There's a golden Absolutely. hour that they can really take fast action, especially if it's a clot. Um, right. Because a clot causes different parts of the brain to die. A bleed actually squeezes the brain and, and impinges the brain. So it's a little bit different, and it right. ultimately will cause the brain to die if there's enough blood in the, in the mm-hmm. cranial cavity. But when you have a clot which is a classic stroke. You have a clot that blocks arteries into the brain, um, and that causes brain cells to die. So right. the quicker you take action with that, the, fa- the better it is. So there is a little mnemonic called FAST, and we're going to go through that. And FAST, you, it is about how do you identify stroke? The first thing, mm-hmm. letter is F, and that stands for face drooping. Does one side of the face droop, or is it numb? Um, ask mm-hmm. the person to smile. Is their smile crooked? Ask the person to stick their tongue out. If the tongue goes to one side instead of going straight out, they're probably having some sort of thing going on in their brain, a, a, a stroke of some sort. Mm-hmm. Arm weakness is another. Like you said, your husband was having difficulty like navigating to find his glasses. Like he was like he wasn't connecting his hand with where the glasses were. But mm-hmm. arm weakness, is it numb? Ask the person to raise both arms. You know? Does one arm mm-hmm. can they keep them both up the same or is one arm like drifting? Is there spe- speech is S. So is their speech slurred? If they're unable to speak or they, you know, like in, in Chris's case, she thought she was speaking clearly and her children mm-hmm. were like, what, what are you saying? Like, it was gibberish. I mean, what, what she thought she was saying was not coming out of her mouth, <laughs> you know? Right. So asking the person to rep- repeat a simple sentence will give you a clearer understanding whether they're having difficulty with their speech. And the T is it's time to call 911. Now, I know you drove your husband to the hospital Mm -hmm. um, because you knew you were 10 minutes away. And once you got him in the car, you were just going to the hospital. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. (laughs) This was not going to the urgent care. We are going directly to the ER. Okay. But... Not everybody can get somebody in a car. Maybe they have already fallen. Maybe they are not. Mm-hmm. They're not ambulatory. Um, call nine one one. Get the ambulance. Tell them the symptoms that they're having. They will immediately look at what what they need to do and and get them to the hospital as quickly as possible. So, you know, so <laughs> fast is the the mnemonic that the people that you use when when you say are you fast because you need to be aware of these signs and symptoms of stroke and one of the things that I've learned about stroke is you know my brother-in-law's brother 
had a stroke at 62. His older sister also had a stroke in her 60s. -hmm. Their mother had multiple strokes in her 60s and 70s. So stroke frequently, you know, the ischemic stroke, which is your typical clot in, in the brain, frequently does have familial that runs in families so Mm -hmm. you're you're you know and what are some of the things that you can do to prevent stroke well you know obviously you want to keep your blood pressure under control and i mean one of the things you talk about with your husband was if he had gotten that appointment with his doctor right would he have recognized or that this was serious you know, right. I'm not confident that he would have. I, I, mean, I think he would have just increased his blood pressure medicine, which, of course, was too little too late. You know, exactly. and it, it's interesting. There have been many, many tests. They've done uh, yeah. been many, many tests on him, and they, they are inconclusive as to what caused it. You know, uh, and failing to find any other reason, they are going with, well, probably his blood pressure. And that's what most of the doctors have thought, not all of them. So it's it's hard. You don't always necessarily know, and it's not always, you know, you could have one and you never had one in your family before or never had one that was recognized no. in your family before. So it's, again, to fast, uh, there's no better mnemonic for it because you have to take fast action. And nobody wants to lose any part of their bodily function. You don't want to lose loss of your arms or your legs or your sight or, or your ability to eat. Fast, fast. That's the solution. That's Absolutely. the only solution available to you. And th- and there's a number of things that you can do to um, avoid having a second a second stroke because frequently once you've had mm-hmm. one, that's something that they do want to make sure they they're going to give you medication. They're going to give you they're going to monitor your blood pressure. They're going to ask you to make certain dietary changes. There's an exercise and various things that you can do to actually prevent having a, a secondary stroke. So, and you can get a lot of really great information at the American Stroke Association. Um, and you can go to AmericanStroke.org is a great place to get information. You can go to StrokeNetwork.org also for some great information. There's lots of local support groups for stroke. And uh, the American Heart Association, they're uh, also very involved in stroke awareness as well. And their website is stroke.org. And you can get information on FAST. You can get information on preventing secondary stroke. You can find out all kinds of information on strokes on any of those websites. It makes such a difference. Your awareness and acting fast, as Kathy did, can make all the difference in the world and the outcome that your loved one experiences or that you experience. So it's important, too, Mm -hmm. to educate even your grandchildren. You know, like... Yeah. Your granddaughter knew something was wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, because typically, grand, you know, pop-up makes her get on the computer to do her work, but instead he was in the bathroom not feeling well. Right. So that makes a huge difference. So for those people that want more information, again, stroke.org, americanstroke.org, and strokenetwork.org, Um, Any of those can give you great resources. I want to thank you for joining me tonight, Kathy. Uh, Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Don't let a disaster blindside you. Get your free planning roadmap and disaster checklist today at thecrisisplanner.com. Be sure to tune in next week as we explore the opioid crisis in your backyard and how Narcan can save lives with Alan Groveman, who's a chief at the Comac Ambulance Corps. This is Linda Fostek. You've been listening to the Linda Fostek Show. Get off the worry-go-round at the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. Until next week, maintain your healthy distancing. Be safe out there. Be fast if you have a situation that requires it. Happy planning. No worries. Thank you, and good night. You've been listening to The Linda Fostek Show. Join Linda each week for interesting topics such as in the news, extreme prepping, and home sweet home. Right here on The Linda Fostek Show. You've been listening.
listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.